Hello everyone, it's Sanjel from the Baha'i Blog team. Today I'm joined by my good friend Esther Maloney. Esther, I don't really know how to introduce you, so I'm going to throw some words out there and you tell me if they are accurate and correct and how you feel about them. Uh, Esther, you're a writer, you're an actor, an artist, a filmmaker, and I would say that you're like a professional encourager. Like you are really, really good at encouraging people and empowering people mm. creatively. Does that seem, does that seem excellent? excellent Joe? Yeah. I often also say I'm a mom and yeah. I think that's, that's also an important part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking mm. that maybe today we could talk about kind of these areas that you work in, these spaces that you are involved in. And I thought that maybe a great place to start would be by teasing out a sentence from the most recent Rizwan message from the Universal House of Justice. I'm going to read that sentence because I want to, the wordsmith that the House of Justice is, I want to honor that. Um, mm. It writes, in this new series of plans, increasing attention needs to be given to the o- to other processes that seek to enhance the life of a community. For example, by improving public health, protecting the environment, or drawing more effectively on the power of the arts. So I was wondering what what you thought of of this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to think about this nine year plan and the context of this expansive prospect before the Baha'i community, and. Um, a few of us were studying this message last night, actually, and we were talking about how this is this is only possible now because of the groundwork that was laid in terms of the educational process mm-hmm. and the vibrancy of collective worship taking place in center after center, village after village, and that that forms like a kind of bedrock in terms of our collective community practices And that now the nine-year plan is allowing us to see that, like, we're not just doing this class or this home visit or working with these youth or so that we can say, like, we did this many of them and isn't that great. But it's all for a purpose, right? And I think it's so exciting to be part of this this vision of the nine-year plan where we see what it's for. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's to build society. It's to you know, I think later there's these beautiful words to create the world anew. So to have that vision of what that's about, I think it just brings so much coherence and, and connection to all of these activities that, we're, that we've all been engaged in for some time. Not that we didn't, I think we, we knew that they were all meaningful, obviously, but now we can see, and I think through this recent film also that the House of Justice has shared, we can see these incredible examples of how like, junior youth coming to a program and studying these concepts is like, that's a nice thing. That's a great thing. But the way in which it impacts Mm -hmm. how they perceive of their education or the way that they help their families or the way that they think about the younger generation, like all of that has these incredible ripple effects into that community to such an extent that elected officials and other collaborators and you know, taxis coming to areas where they wouldn't come because it used to be so unsafe. So there are these actual marked shifts Mm -hmm. and, and that's really exciting. And I think, you know, when I first read this sentence, I thought, oh, wow, like interesting. These are the for examples. Yes. So there are three examples here. And, you know, I thought, well, this might be just like a random grab bag of examples, but I think we know <laughs> the level of care and thought that goes into these letters. There's nothing random. And so it's interesting to look at these three, public health, protecting the environment, and the power of the arts. Mm. And I feel like certainly the first two we can really see, especially coming through the pandemic, how vital these two things have become and are. Um And then the third one, I feel like is, you know, it sounds good, but I think many of us are asking ourselves, like, what does that mean? Drawing Mm -hmm. more effectively on the power of the arts. And why is that so important right now? Why is that an arena in which the House of Justice is asking us to focus? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think there's a lot there, you know, and even in the wording of it, like, we're not saying just add more arts. Yes. 
it's talking about drawing more effectively on the power of the arts. So there's a lot of, a lot to kind of unpack there. Like what is the power of the arts? Mm -hmm. Um, What is the power of storytelling? What is the power of like the realm of emotion that we enter into and we see a beautiful piece of visual art or we listen to a song that completely changes our orientation to our day or, you know, I think many people say that the arts have gotten us through the pandemic. The mm-hmm. arts have gotten us through very difficult, challenging times. And that's historically true of communities over centuries that we've we've sung when things were difficult. We've moved our bodies collectively as communities to feel like bonds of solidarity and joy. And so drawing effectively on the, on the power of the arts, it makes me think also of the global conferences. Mm-hmm. It makes me think about how we can ex- not only come to know things through the arts, but we can express that knowledge very powerfully. And maybe we've seen a lot of examples of people expressing knowledge through the arts, but I'm also always fascinated by how do we come to know through the arts, through engaging with the arts, that when we allow ourselves to be involved in a craft or refining that craft, and Abdul Baha encourages each of us to develop a craft, mm. Like, why does he ask us that? Why does it have that significance in, in the Baha'i faith that we should all have a craft and that we should work with our hands and we should engage with the material world in that way? There has to be some kind of like dynamic interplay between the material and the spiritual that is expressed through art making, through craft. Um, and that's maybe just at the individual level, but then I think the message is encouraging us to see it at a collective level, at a community level. What does it mean to draw on this power in terms of bettering our communities? Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like we're just starting to see some very small glimmerings of this. And of course it'll come through the community building process, but when we engage with the arts, we're engaging with ambiguity we're engaging with process we're engaging with our discomfort Mm -hmm. we're engaging with resistance with limitation with not knowing the outcome when we engage in an art form like filmmaking or theater it's collaborative and we have to make space for one another and so there are all of these dynamics within art making like if you crack open that idea of the arts And you could pull out a bunch of things that are in there. I think we would see that many of them are very deeply linked to spiritual practice and our own inner spiritual lives. Yes. Yeah. You know, the, it makes me think like sometimes we think about the power of the arts in terms of like art as a product that we then listen to or watch. Um, But I think that there is something incredible about creating art in community, whether you're engaging in an art form that is solitary, like writing, or whether you're weaving something as a group. I think there's, I think there's such magic there about creating together in a community. And I know you have experience with this. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Mm, Like creating in community? Creating spaces for community to make, to be creative together. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so many different ways that can look. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was talking about this with someone recently that, you know, sometimes you come in with a goal yeah. and you come in saying, we all have to make this thing together. Like we know that we're going from point A to point B and there's going to be an outcome and people are going to look at it and it's going to look a certain way. And there's a, an energy that can kind of come around that where everybody mm-hmm. is moving towards that goal. And I think about like leading film projects or inviting people to kind of contribute to some collective, you know, mural or something where there is a vision, there's an outcome and it's linked to being a service mm-hmm. to a community in some way, like beautifying this space or telling the story of this neighborhood, et cetera. And then there are also processes where we just create a space for anything to happen. Mm-hmm. And that is a different thing because you know you're at point A, but you don't know what point B is. And there might be mm-hmm. like point B, C, D, E, <laughs> like you don't know where you're going. 
but you know that the going is important and you know that gathering mm-hmm. together is valuable. And I think I just think of like book seven or some of the practices around the institute process. I feel like they're actually a little bit in that category that we study the creative word of God. We think about what this means to us and, and then we make, yeah. and if we allow space and time for that really interesting branches and offshoots can come through that creative process and we don't know. So yeah. even like the person who's leading that space may not know. And it becomes something that is really organic and starts to come from a community or a population or a group of people who are like, what if we do this? Mm. Oh, I like that. I'm going to work on your thing. Oh, do you need help? And then it just starts to kind of snowball and has this really beautiful constructive building energy to it. Um, But I think that, I mean, for me, that's been a big part of my practice is relinquishing the feeling that I need to make it look a certain way, be a certain way, Mm -hmm. Um, and that's always a tension that exists in community engaged art is, you know, we hold aesthetics and participation as two poles and that the tension between those two poles is really generative. It's a good tension because we want to create beauty. Beauty is, of course, like one of the things that our hearts are attracted to. And, and then creating art is this perpetual <laughs> process of not quite getting there and being infuriated and it's so human (laughs) and then to do it as a collective oh my gosh it's like consultation it can be a nightmare right and then on the other side we're saying everyone needs to be part of this everyone Mm -hmm. should participate and we all have those feelings like but not the people who are bad at this not the people who are going to mess it up like (laughs) and that those are those poles and I think even that at that level becomes a mirror for aspects of the community building process that we want to see kinship and not difference. Yes. But we tend to, to the, our eyes are trained by the society we're in to see difference and maybe to, to resist, right. Even in small, subtle ways. So I feel like those poles is it's, it's navigating that constantly and just being aware of what, what, activities, what approach, what introduction, what every element of a space that is created for collective making has to be intentional because it all it all has ripple effects that create things along those two poles. Yeah, and then you'd have to redefine what what excellence is, right? Like if you're trying to achieve something as a group and it's not going to turn out the way you thought it was. Just like in consultation, the truth comes out that we never would have imagined on our own. I never, that's amazing. I never really yeah. considered that aspect before. It's messy stuff. Yes. Well, it's messy stuff, even individually trying to do it. So I can only imagine the exponential level of messiness in doing it together in a way that is humble and loving and honest and unified. And then maybe like one of the guardrails that we have that we're really fortunate to have is like the sentence after this sentence reminds us that it's the capacity to engage in systematic learning in all these areas, right? And this ability to draw on the accumulated store of human knowledge generated through scientific inquiry. So like we don't just randomly do stuff. We always come back to that pattern of reflection and action. So to, to do something creatively doesn't mean that, you know, the arts and the sciences are not diametrically opposed. We could still use a scientific process to return and say, how did that go? Was it effective? How many people came? Did it create the desired impact? What did we learn? What, what, what about our process was, you know, sound was building unity. Where did we, go off the rails a bit. What can we tweak? What can we, so to have that systematic process allows things to improve exponentially. Cause then there isn't this pressure that you're going to do it the one time and it's going to be genius. <laughs> so if we're talking about like um, scientific inquiry and creativity together, I was wondering if you want to share some thoughts about prayer and creativity and the connection between the two. Hmm. <laughs> well, I think in the writings we know that the the source of of the arts mm. and I'm not saying the quote properly, but is the power of reflection. Arts, crafts, and sciences is the power of reflection. So 
it, I, I really wrestle with this a lot. And I think many of us are living really in an age and an environment of constant distraction yes. where we're pulled out of ourselves continuously. And, and we're all, we're, we're in a, a mode of doing, which is so wonderful. We want to be in a mode of doing, we don't want to just be talking the, all the time, talking, talking, talking. We want to be doing things, but then to create like a habit you know, and in prayer is, mm. is one of those places where we can create that habit of returning to ourselves, returning to like to the creator and really asking for, asking for a vision, asking for guidance, asking for assistance. And I think in, in creative work, that is very prominent, like reading a lot of writers and thinkers around creativity People talk about this and they use all kinds of different language, yes. but the, the, the key point I think is very aligned with, with what we see in the Baha'i writings, which is this idea that we can be a channel. We can yes. pray to be made an open and pure channel and that there are, I think, stories and there are films and there are songs and there are all kinds of books and ideas that need to come into reality. So I feel like prayer can be this practice that like refines our heart or kind of you know um cleans the mirror of our hearts like all of those images allow us to be more open yeah so I see prayer as is very powerful and and probably I think the other part of it which I'm always learning about is meditation like you don't just pray and then walk away just pray 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 and then I'm like okay gotta go like but to actually listen and be like okay now like what am I supposed to do with this yeah. and really have that power of reflection yeah and I think um in an earlier conversation you and I were talking about this idea of taking walks walking mm-hmm. walking without listening to anything without looking at anything but just walking it because then you're really you're with yourself there's no there's no one there but your own thoughts and allowing yourself as you walk step by step to be pulled further and further into a state of reflection. Mm, that's so true. Yeah. And you were sharing that someone had written, don't, don't think it counts when you take your dog for a walk because then you're going on your dog's <laughs> walk and not your walk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a great point. Yeah. Um, and this person, Julie Cameron, she also suggests ask yourself a question. And then go for a walk and see what the answer is. Yeah. See what, see what when you allow yourself to come into that state of reflection, what kind of an answer you you receive. Yeah, and I think it's such a it's a powerful example too of how our bodies are our tools. Our bodies are given to us to facilitate all kinds of processes. And I think there's a lot of learning being generated about this yeah. around how movement and the brain are connected and how like maybe for a long time, you know, many of us were raised in school systems where we just had to sit and produce, you know, things. And I know like the other day, my son was like kicking a soccer ball around the living room and he was saying, tell me multiplications. <laughs> and I was just had to like yell at him like a hundred times four and 20 times two. And da, da, da. he just was like more, more, more. And he's like kicking the soccer ball. And I'm like, what is going on here? But I thought, how often does he get to learn this way at school where, Mm. you know, he's able to move his body and it's like, I could just see this link, like his body was moving and his mind was moving and the two things were happening at the same time. I want to come back to something you said earlier, this idea about, I guess, inspiration or the source of, of ideas coming from above, you know, coming from God or the creator and it not having to do with us. And it makes me think, I think, that prayer by George Townsend about make me a hollow reed, right? So that it can just, uh, you, you become an instrument. And I think that that is really freeing because then any success is not yours, but any failure is not yours either, really. It has nothing to do with you. You're just, you're just the instrument for creating it. But I wonder, I know sometimes people, well, I, I feel like there are Baha'is who feel conflicted between their calling to be creative and their participation in community life and avenues of service that feel more concrete. I was wondering what thoughts you would have, have on that. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And that's very real. Um, you know, there are so many 
avenues of service and our lives are, you know, there are seasons to our lives too. And there are seasons where we are called upon to serve in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're learning in the Baha'i community how to actually celebrate that and not feel like I should be doing what someone who's in a different season of life should be doing yeah. to, to really look at our own circumstances and see what are the possibilities before us? What are the creative ways in which we can apply the teachings? What, what is before us? Um, and maybe we carry a lot of residual shoulds and feelings of heaviness that, you know, whatever we pick up, that means we're not picking up the other thing, you know, it, that there's always this feeling of like, if I put my time here, I'm not putting my time there. If I put my energy here, I'm not there. Um, I think this is very big for mothers and parents because there are so many demands made on our time. <laughs> And we see the possibilities, like we are so connected in many different ways. You're maybe at like the apex of your career or your work. And then you're also able to like connect with a lot of other families. And then your own children, of course, have so many needs. And, and, and of course, you want to like pour yourself into that work. Um, and I think this, you know, this learning around coherence and not cutting our lives up is there's really something to that, like saying, okay, if it's all one, and if, if all service to God is service to God, whether I'm mm -hmm. nursing my baby, whether I'm having a visit with my neighbor, whether I'm serving on a Baha'i institution, all of it is service. All of it is I'm swimming in the water, no matter what I'm doing here. Um, I think that thought always brings me a lot of peace. And I think comparison is really a killer. <laughs> You know, we can tend to look at others and assume all kinds of things that we don't actually know. And, and ultimately, we just have to come back to ourselves. That's the only arena in which we're able to act. We have no agency over others' souls. Um, and then I think what's really interesting is looking at energetically how feeding one part of our life, because our life is one, feeding something into one of those channels or tributaries kind of ends up traveling into all the other channels. So sometimes we might feel like, well, if I'm putting energy here, I'm not putting energy there. Yeah. And I feel like I've been experimenting with how that's not true. That if, if I put energy into anything, whatever that is starts to grow and seep into the other aspects of my life. Yes. So I think there are some of us who are really, when we have that creative calling, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's linked to our wellness, it's linked to our health, our vitality, it's linked to our ability to be joyful members of our communities yeah. and families. So I, I think that I've seen, you know, in my own life and in the lives of others. And for other people, it might be different. It might be that you need to move your body daily. And that's like a really important priority. Or people have all kinds of, we're all different engines, which is perfect. We want all the different kinds of engines. So seeing that when I give that time uh, and when I give it life in that way, and that can look very different, right? Because we also have this idea, like if I give my creative life energy, it has to be my full-time job. It has to be this, it has to be, like blow all that up. But if it's just... I'm going to give that energy. And that might look like I just explore the beach differently with my kid that day, mm -hmm. or um, like it could be so many different things. Or I say, I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day writing something down because it makes me feel better about everything, you know, because it's like breathing for me. Then you do that. And then suddenly maybe you're in a better mood with your spouse or you're, you know, more joyful with your family. Or when you get asked to serve in a particular way, you find that your well is a little fuller. Yes. So I feel like all of these things, they affect one another. Um, and I think we can become a bit scientific about looking at that. Mm -hmm. Like as I feed one part of my life, let's say I just say, I'm going to say a lot more prayers. I need to ask for more assistance. You know, and that might just be one effort we make. And then we start to see all of these other things that kind of snowball into that yes yes you know the emoji of the head that <laughs> yes. brain explosion that's how I feel about this at this juncture in my life where I've decided to take my calling as a writer more seriously and devote more time and energy to that I realized that 
oh, wow, trying to be a better writer actually means being more conscientious about the time I spend in private prayer. It means Mm. being more dedicated about moving my body and getting, you know, walking more often. And then lo and behold, not only is the writing easier, but I am a better mother. I'm more patient. I'm more compassionate because I have felt like I have fulfilled this need that I didn't even know I had time, time to do. And then it also reflects the energy that I have in other endeavors of community life. Like, yes, I can help with this. I have the energy to do this because I've been walking and I've been writing and I've been doing all of these things. And I never would have expected, like I knew logically about that that you know, false dichotomy, but I didn't live it until recently. It was very, very true. It makes me emotional hearing you say that. I, I don't know why. I think just because we, it's one of these things like we don't even realize the kinds of ways that we might be inhibiting ourselves through our own patterns of thought mm-hmm. until we can crack it open a little go- bit and say, wait a minute. What if that's not how I want to think? What if there's another way of thinking about this? And I feel like, thank God we have the writings. Thank God we have like these frameworks that help us kind of question things and go, wait a sec, where did I get that idea? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Esther, thank you so, so much for your time and for exploring these, these nebulous ideas. Is there anything I didn't talk about, any subjects in particular that, that you'd like to share while we are having this conversation? I don't, I, there's nothing in particular. I just, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk and share. And I, I love that you encourage, you, you encourage, you in, introduced me as an encourager. And I would just say, if anyone's listening and you want to connect, like, please find me on the, on the internet. I'm pretty findable. Um, and I, I would just love to, I love to help creators bring their visions into life and to also help folks think about some of these barriers or because this inner the inner world that we have is very linked to our ability to take steps um and particularly with creativity it's just such a beautiful it's a topic close to my heart that's wonderful thank you so so much esther thank you sanjal <laughs>